Man, it's been a while since AEW did a pay-per-view like, damn! Four months, but it feels like a year actually. And since then, there's been a bunch of stuff that's happened that would be hard to describe in one video. We had Ricky Starks and MJF facing off, William Regal turning heel and leaving, then he had that promo from backstage where he's talking about how he wished the Blackpool Combat Club well. Darby Allen, a CNT champion. There's just been a bunch of stuff that's been going on. Recently, me personally, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I haven't really been feeling AEW recently. There's just a lot of stuff off about it. It feels like it lost its identity a bit. Recently, the build for this pay-per-view has not been the best. There's only been a couple of stuff that interested me in the build, but I wasn't really eager to watch this pay-per-view. Like, I wasn't craving an AEW pay-per-view due to the way they built up this pay-per-view. However, the pay-per-view itself turned out to be much, much, much better than the build, and it's actually one of the best AEW pay-per-views they've ever done, in my personal opinion. Now, let's not waste time. Let's get into it. The first match on the show is between Chris Jericho and Ricky Starks. This feud had been brewing for three months. Starks as a babyface works well. It's just that a lot's been going on in AEW that it doesn't feel as prominent as it should be. At least from my perspective, because a feud with Chris Jericho is somewhat big. I didn't really care about the build of the match because it was forgettable. And if you ask me now about it, all I remember is Jericho with the mask attacking Starks. With that said, the match was solid. It was actually a very good match for Jericho. I always hear people talk bad about him because he's always in the spotlight his feuds go on long but this was good starks was finally in the forefront in a good way with a victory against the first aew champion it's a step in the right direction with absolute and the best part of the match for me was when starks went for the spear and walked into the code breaker then of course you had that anime like moment with jericho going for the judas effect only for it to get blocked by starks who ended up winning the match awesome spot but personally i hope he moves on from the Jericho Appreciation Society. For some reason, the feuds feel cursed to last so long. So maybe if we're lucky, this feud ends around double or nothing. The next match is a final burial match. Christian Cage faced Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Now this match is basically a casket match with Dirt Near. Jungle Boy slowly evolving out of the Jungle Boy character, which is best. You know, if he wants to advance, he needs to change it up. Christian Cage, on the other hand, has been one of the best heels in AEW. His experience really helps him shine brighter than most. And he's really put in more effort than you would expect. Like, he isn't just around to be around. He wants to be one of the best. This was no different. Christian's dark side forced Jack Perry to match that level of deviousness and basically changed him into something he wasn't. The story is very compelling, both men played their roles well, and Jungle Boy received his biggest victory of his career. He had to go to the depths of hell to do it though. Great story in Christian, he's been on another level as a heel. I'm very interested in what's next for him. I, I, I really am. Ironically, it's been two years since he signed. I don't know, maybe he's done. Although I doubt it because it just doesn't seem likely he'd sign a two-year contract, but... I don't know. Regardless, I'm eager to see him feud with somebody like Ricky Starks or even Hangman Adam Page. Following that match was a trios tag team match for the AEW Trios Championships. The House of Black faced the Elite. This was what I expected it to be. The House of Black always performs well in these situations, but then you add the Elite, you get some cracked up action. And the match embodies what the trios division is all about. Athleticism, wild spots, and ridiculous near falls. Six men in the ring means almost non-stop action. The most memorable spot was definitely Omega's V-Trigger on Julia Hart. It came from out of nowhere, and once he realized what he did, he's like, ah, oh, whatever. Then there was that knee from out of nowhere on Matt Jackson, I believe, and that led to the House of Black winning the titles. It's exactly what you want from a trios match. Omega is exceptional, and Heike, I hope he goes on a singles run again. House of Black winning the titles wasn't surprising to me, but I had the Elite retaining. They lost, and only time will tell if they go their separate ways once again. The next match is for the AEW Women's Championship. Soraya and Ruby Soho challenged Jamie Hayter for the gold. Soraya has undergone one of the most bizarre random heel turns, and it's very uninteresting to me, I'm not gonna lie. It's all part of this AEW versus Outsider story, which I assume is going to get even more intense than it is now. Jamie Hayter has been the best women's champion for AEW. She gives off a vibe of here to stay, unlike Tony Storm and Thunder Rosa. In the former's case, she was an interim champion, and in the latter's case, her title run didn't get going. I wasn't really expecting much from this title match because of recent events like the Soraya heel turn and spray paint thing, but it was better than expected. It's not a world beater or excellent, but good enough. The match is not going to stand on the show, and if anything, the post-match segment is what's going to be remembered. After Jamie Hayter retained the title, Storm and Soraya attacked her and Baker. Ruby watched on. She didn't really want to get involved, but once she did, she got rid of the other two. They're out there standing in the ring when all of a sudden, Ruby connects with a clean Pele kick that would make Finn Balor proud. Storm apparently had something personal with the cameraman because she just went after him like that and started breaking things and they brought out that spray can again and posed to top the originals. It's clear where they've been going with this for quite some time and I'm just wondering if it's going to lead to blood and guts because this feud makes sense inside that structure. 
The next match is a Texas death match. John Moxley faces Hangman Adam Page. This feud has been intense from the start. It makes sense they settle things with this match. That said, I didn't think it would be this brutal. John Moxley straight up is a demon. No doubt about it. He probably sees this as a holiday for himself. Also, I'm just wondering, like, who would win a first blood match between Mox and Ric Flair? With that said, this was one of the most insane AEW matches I've ever seen. Me personally, I don't really like these violent matches as much as I did when I was a kid. But if something's good, you best believe I will like it. Here, I knew they would get violent, but it's like they surpassed that expectation because this was something else. Mox was feasting on Hangman's forehead. He brought out a wrench, I believe, and it was all about who would endure more pain. I can't really describe the level of violence on display here because you just had to watch it. This went to a whole nother level. The final parts of the match were very smooth, especially that buckshot counter into the paradigm shift. Then Mox followed with a curb stomp on the bricks. I love how he was his own enemy during this match. He wrapped a chain on his neck and basically handed the victory to Hangman, who similar to Jungle Boy, had to dig down deep and become his worst self to beat John Moxley. And the other night, this match main event had crowd interest, violence, violence, and violence. Hangman feels revitalized. He's recovered that hype he had two years ago, and the only negative thing about him at this point is his new theme song. Like, why'd they have to change it? The next match is the TNT Championship. Samoa Joe defending the gold against Wardlow. Joe's turned it around recently in AEW. His feud with Darby felt like a classic feud for the company. It's just one of those feuds that would not feel out of place during the early time period of AEW. He's now a two-time TNT champion and holds ROH gold as well. And Wardlow had been demoralized and embarrassed after Joe cut his ponytail and he's looking for retribution. Personally, I was somewhat zoned down during this match and it wasn't going to follow what we saw in the slightest. But it was just there, you know, the match was just there, decent. So even though it wasn't going to follow up the previous match, it doesn't really stand out. Result-wise, we all know Wardlow would reclaim his gold. The question now, though, is will Powerhouse Hobbs win the title on Dynamite? I'm leaning towards yes because the title is literally hot potato. It's a TV title, and I don't expect anything else. The next match is the AEW Tag Team Championships. The Guns defended the gold against Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal, Orange Cassidy and Dan Housen, and the Acclaimed. The Guns winning the titles on Dynamite seemed almost crazy because regardless of their talent, they fell so inferior to the Acclaimed. And the stunned audience the moment they won the titles was incredible. This match though was the goofiest on the card. Sanjay and Satnam got their moments, Dan Housen won the curse the giant and it somewhat worked, but action wise it's just there. It got better as time went on though. Seeing Jeff Jarrett wrestle Orange Cassidy and Dan Housen is strange and weird, but because of all these elements I preferred it over Joe and Wardlow for different reasons. It was more of an entertaining match. Low key I had the acclaimed regaining the titles or even Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal because the guns felt like a fluke but it all made sense why they were retained as after the match FTR returned. The duo regaining the titles remains to be seen because their contract status is up in the air but I'm glad they're back because FTR whenever they wrestle they always had these big time matches the old school vibe with them and I just love their matches. My favorite AEW match last year was literally the Bucks against FTR. And the main event, MJF defending the AEW World Championship against Brian Danielson and an Iron Man match. This is the one that we've been waiting for. Now we don't see Iron Man matches often and usually the biggest problem with the matches is time. Since there's a small collection of Iron Man matches, the wrestlers can't really excel in the match. Unless you're Brian Danielson. Danielson's had experience in time limit draw matches, so this had the makings of a classic. MJF's been in this weird pattern where he just pulls something from out of nowhere. People talk negative about him and he does it again. He just pulls out something. And on the other side, some people wish he was that hedonistic devil that leaned towards being a face and it, and it might be a missed opportunity for AEW. Regardless though, this performance during this match showed that Maxwell Jacob Friedman is here to stay. This match, incredible. It was incredible. One of the best matches in AEW history easily. The story of the confident champion walking into an area where he was absolutely inferior and his opponent was a man that knew everything about 60 minute matches. His experience went beyond conditioning. Brian Danielson had 60 minute matches memorized. He knew how to wrestle in them. He, he just knew what to do during these types of matches. But MJF was able to show that wrestling skill others doubt he had. His dirty tactics of course emerged and he used them to his advantage going from 0 to 0 to 0 to 2 for Brian after getting disqualified and in 20 seconds 2 to 2. Then of course you have MJF throwing a bottle full of tequila in a kid's face which turned out to be a bigger problem than he probably expected it to be. MJF outperformed Brian, he was dominating him inside and outside the ring but when it was near the end of the match Brian kicked it up a notch and essentially became the man that held the ROH world title for over a year, the man that made an event to WrestleMania basically. It was at his very best and it seemed like MJF finally understood that he was going up against the wrestling machine. 
Both men had an issue. MJF with the knee, Brian with the arm, but they went all out in an effort to win the biggest match, the biggest prize, the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. The match is already kicked into high gear, but they went above and beyond what you expected from them. Slowly but surely, I was starting to believe the American Dragon had, especially during extra time, because both men were drawn after 60 minutes. At this point, MGF was going for every cheap tactic, and almost every single one of them wasn't working. If anything, the momentum had swung in Brian's favor. And when you see this image, it starts to become convincing that we were going to see a new champion. But he kicked out. He kicked out, and it was ridiculous. It was very crazy. Not necessarily because he kicked out, but the way he kicked out. If I remember correctly, he kicked out at 2.9. MGF was in agony with the submission hold, but he used the oxygen tank to drop Brian and lock him in the label lock, forcing him to tap out. So he did what he said he was going to do. He was going to beat Brian Danielson in an Iron Man match. And oh my god, this this it's really one of the best AEW matches of all time. No doubt about it. It's not one of those matches where people just say, oh, it's one of the best. And you look at it six months later, it's not. It truly is. I wonder how I'm going to look at this match later on. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have the same opinion because these guys really took the 60 minutes and made the most out of them. And it's hard to have a great outstanding Iron Man match, but these guys had just that. It's really one of the best Iron Man matches of all time, and that's saying something because this match is not an easy match to compete in. It ain't no Hell in a Cell, no TLC, none of that. This match requires endurance, fitness, and ideas. You can't just go wrestling for 60 minutes. You got to think of how you wrestle, and these guys did such a great job with it. Match of the night. I didn't think it was going to be match of the night, but it definitely is. It was the best match. It showed that MJF is legit. This guy could wrestle. He could have these great matches. And we all know he could, but it cemented that fact. That's what I think of this match. All right, that's AEW Revolution. The weakest match on the show was probably Joe and Wardlow. But other than that, everything was decent, good, great, amazing, ridiculous, over the top, tremendous, iconic, all that. The Texas death match was too damn violent. That was ridiculous. Hangman was revitalized with that win he looked great and other than that i love the christian and jungle boy match I, I really thought it helped jungle boy a lot to reach a certain point where people doubted whether or not he had that in him but yeah the main event was the match of the night if you didn't watch you gotta go ahead and watch it hell go watch the entire pay-per-view you never had because it's really outstanding it's really one of AEW's best pay-per-views. So, yeah. All right, what did you guys think of Revolution? Please comment down below. And that's for Zinni. Make sure you hit the paradigm shift on the like button and perhaps the knee on the subscribe button. Peace. All right.